Well, I, I can honestly say that's the first time I've uh, enjoyed an introduction by Chad. Yeah. He's, he's hugely not kind to me. I don't know. I don't know what I've done. <laughs> um, I, was I was really nervous about speaking tonight, not, not being in the pulpit and preaching, but my watch is still on central time, and so I was afraid I was going to be an hour late. But I wasn't. I'd like to thank the eldership for allowing me to preach tonight. <clears throat> you know, that, it's, maybe it's one of my pet peeves, but preachers preach. You know, we, we say, we're going to have a speaker tonight. And, and I, I can get up in front of hundreds of people and speak. I, I, I have that ability. But preaching's a little different. You know, it's not me up here preaching. I'm not preaching my words, it's God's word. That's a little different. I'd like to thank the eldership for uh, allow allowing me to preach tonight. And uh, A year ago, a year and a few, a few days ago, uh, Chris and I were talking about me preaching, and I said, well, I'll preach in a few days and then I'll come back in a year, and if there's not a, not a market improvement, then, you know, y'all can fire me from being supported at preacher school. This congregation and, and a few others are, are supporting me financially while I'm at Memphis School of Preaching. And I'd like to thank this congregation for uh, supporting me the last year. Uh, as my dad was sick. And for that, I'm grateful. You know, I, I've been preaching around in uh, Arkansas and Mississippi and Tennessee, and there's a lot of great congregations out there. And uh, Bremen's my favorite. Before I get into my sermon, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Memphis School of Preaching. Um, not too long, so Jacob, calm down. I've got this all factored into the whole, the whole deal. We'll, I, I, I'll get you out of here on time, hopefully. Well, I've, I've completed my first year. Uh, it's tough. There were times I thought I wouldn't make it. There were times that I thought I needed to sleep. Evidently, I didn't. Um, it's a two-year school. I have about 10 months to go. Um, so far, we've studied 36 books of the Bible. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot. It's 36 books of the Bible plus their commentary, and some of those commentaries are most are uh, four to five hundred pages long. There was one we had that was a thousand page. Yeah, it's a lot of reading, a lot of not sleeping, but just a lot of study. The first day of class. We had an assignment, and that assignment was to memorize a scripture, was to memorize a verse, Psalms 119.11. Thy word have I hid in my, mine heart, that I, may, may not, that I might not sin against thee. That was on a Friday, and it took me all weekend to memorize it. It was tough, you know. I'm one of the older students in my class, and, you know, the, the, we have these 18-year-old guys that look at it once, and, and they have it, and they, that wasn't the case for me, you know. And I struggled with, with memory work throughout the year, um, putting more time into it, learning how to do it. This past quarter, we memorized <laughs> the entire book of James, and... It's only five chapters, and one of those chapters has 27 verses. And <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I, I don't know how I, how I did it. And I'm not saying I, I got a 100 on each chapter. I made an A on four of them. I missed a few words and a few punctuation marks, and, 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 and I got a B on the, the last one. 
but going, you know, that's, it's tough. My brain was rusty, I, I struggled, but I kept going. We have one instructor that, uh, it's whatever, you, you know, you come to him with a problem, he, he, his response is always, you can do it, you can do it. Just gotta keep doing it. Before going to Memphis, I, there were some things that, that I was wrong about. I don't mean that I, that, that I had making, made a mistake about some things or maybe misunderstood some things or some things that, that I believed that, that I was wrong. I mean, I, I was wrong about those things. Since then, I've, re, I've repented. I've changed my mind about them. If you'll turn with me to uh, Matthew 5, verse 3. Matthew 5, 3. Matthew 5, 3 through 7, 27. It's a couple of chapters. I'm not going to read it. What this is is the Sermon on the Mount. That's where Jesus is talking. And if, if your Bible is like mine, it, those, those words are written in red. And for some reason, I don't know if someone told me this or I don't know where I got it. But for some reason... These words meant more than the ones that are written in black. That these words were more important. And and that we should pay attention more to them than the others. What I've learned, uh, looking at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God be perfect, meaning complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All the words are, by, are from inspiration by, by, means he breathed them out, all, all of them. But to pay attention to all of them. The reason, and I, I'm not the only one that thought that way, Studying about it and and looking at it, the reason that there's I mean there, there's a doctrine out there that says that, that the ones in red are are more important and we should only pay attention to those. It's because when they find something in the Bible, say in like the book book of Galatians, a false teacher will see that see, see something in there and they don't agree with it. They don't want to do that. So well, that 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 was written by Paul, but it wasn't. It was all written by the same person. It's all written by the same person. James 4, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What I want to talk about tonight is, is being tempted, tempted to sin, and how to resist that. You know, there's a time in my life when I thought that the devil tempted me, and, and that because he did, that I had done something wrong. But Satan tempts everybody. That's, that's beyond our control, to an extent. Satan tempts everybody. Now, us, if we submit to that temptation, if we give in to that temptation, then that becomes a sin. That's something that we need to work on. I want to talk about three points tonight. What is temptation? Who is tempted? And how to resist temptation? There are only three, three kind of temptations. Now, it, it seems like there are a lot, you know, because we can maybe look at the different sins we've committed in our life and say, well, these, there's no way these are related. But there's, a, there's only three temptations, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Lust of the flesh is, is some temptation to feel physical pleasure, whether it's a sexual sin, alcohol, drugs, hunger, thirst. Some of these desires we think of uh, as natural desires, yet when they're taken to the extreme or used improperly, they become a sin. 
We're enticed by the lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes is when we look upon things with desire or pleasure that God does not want us to does not want us to have, like pornography, other, others' material possessions, another man's wife, another woman's husband. We're enticed by the pride of life. Pride of life is when we meet, when we want to take credit for something that someone else has done, to be the center of attention or to have power over others. This could even apply to taking credit for what God has done for us. Who's tempted? Turn with me to Genesis 3, 1 through 4. It's toward the beginning. Um, Genesis 3, 1 through 4. I will read that. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman... Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto, to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Eve knew over in chapter 2, 16 and 17, God told Adam, you can eat of all these trees except this one, and if you eat of this one, you will surely die. Eve knew that because that's what she told the serpent. She to that's what she told him. She repeated it to him. The serpent, Satan, he, he changed one word, not, you shall not surely die. So was that a complete lie that, he, that, that Satan told Eve? Was it, a, was, it a, was it totally a lie, that one statement? Yes. Even though he only changed one word, it was a complete lie. Satan, Satan is a liar. He's, he's been a liar forever. John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is not truth in him. When he speaketh a lie... He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Even Jesus was tempted. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. <laughs> Back up just a little bit. What happened to Eve? Yeah, she ate the fruit. She gave it to her husband. And sin entered the world. She didn't, she didn't resist the devil. She didn't resist Satan. She used God's word. She said, we can't eat of, the, we can't eat of this tree. Satan said, yes, you can. We're not told that Eve said anything else. She resisted him once. Sometimes that's not enough. Now we're at Matthew 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up, out of, the, led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter, that's, that's Satan, came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made of bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and sit, sitteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, 
and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, in verse 3, and when, the, and when the tempter came, he said, Command these stones to be made. Satan was trying to draw him out by the lust of the flesh, of his physical needs. He was hungry. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. In verse 6, Satan was trying to entice Jesus with the pride of life. And in verse 9, we look at, and, he, and saith unto him, All these things will I give you, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan was trying to tempt Jesus with the lust of the eyes, offering him the glory and the kingdoms of the world, which I find amusing because this is the Son of God. This is God on earth. Jesus was present when the earth was created. And Satan's trying to offer it, offer it to him. The world belongs to God. So it was one of those, how could he offer it to him if he didn't have it? Jesus used scripture to resist Satan's temptation. When, when tempted with the lust of the flesh, hunger, Jesus resisted by saying, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out, out of the mouth of God. Now, it's written in Matthew 4, but it's a reference to Deuteronomy 8, 3. Jesus knew the scripture. When tempted with the pride of life, Jesus re replied similarly. Jesus said unto him, and it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is a reference to Deuteronomy 6, 16. Again, Jesus, Jesus knows the scripture. When tempted with lust of the eyes, Jesus once again resisted. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. A reference to Deuteronomy 6.13. Jesus used, Jesus used the word of God. Jesus used scripture to resist the devil. Was it just once? No. Does Satan only tempt us once? No. It comes back and comes back and comes back. We have to resist. Back in the 1980s, um, some of you weren't, weren't born yet, then, but I think Chris was, so... Uh, Nancy Reagan, first lady, the uh, president's wife is always given some kind of, some kind of project. Uh, maybe it's illiteracy or um, I think uh, the last president, her, her uh, president's wife, her project was school lunch or something like that. I'm not sure that worked out. But Nancy Reagan's project was uh, drug addiction. And... I'm sure they spent a lot of money on coming up with um, committees and projects and stuff, and they, they came up with this very simple slogan, and it was, just say no. Now, I don't remember a lot about it then. Later years, I learned a little, little about the just say no thing, and people, most people made fun of it because it was so simple. It was ju just say no. And it, it, it worked as long as you say no. As long as our actions match what we say, then the just say no works. Let's look, let's look at Genesis chapter 39. Genesis 39. 
some of you know, Genesis 39 is about Joseph, this section of Genesis. And at this point, um, Joseph is about 17 years old, and his brothers have thrown him in a pit, told his father that he was killed by a beast, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites are travelers. They like, uh, well, like when we think of the desert and we think of camels and tents and stuff, that's, they're, they're nomadic people. Well, they, they bought Joseph and they took him to Egypt and they sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. He's a very important man. Had a large household, wealthy man. And he became so, as time went on, Joseph became so valuable to Potiphar. Potiphar noticed that God's uh, favor was on, on Joseph because everything he did prospered. He made Joseph overseer of all his, of, of all his possessions, all his house, his fields. He, he made Joseph an, the overseer of that. And if we look at Verse 7, 39, verse 7. Helps if I'm in the right chapter. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in thine house, in, thy, in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass that she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it, came and it came about this time that Joseph went into the house to do this, do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment into her hand and fled and got him out. Now, the story goes on. Uh, she lied. Potiphar is prison. Verse 8, he refused. He refused. Verse 10, spake to Joseph day by day. It doesn't say if it was a few weeks or a few months, but she was... She was after him every day, every day, every day, constantly. Now, Joseph knew it was wrong. God, uh, he knew that it would be a sin against God. You know, anytime we sin, it is a sin against God. You know, whether it's you steal someone's bicycle if I went over to J Jacob's house and I stole his bicycle, I've got his attention now. He's paying attention now. So, you know, that would be a sin against Jacob, but it would also be a sin against God. Anytime I sin, it's a sin against God. Joseph, Joseph said no. Joseph said no. Joseph said no. This is how Satan tempts us. You know, he'll say, it, it's okay. Nobody will know. It'll, it'll be just this one time. You surely won't die. So what did Joseph do? He fled. He removed himself physically from the situation. How many times does this happen to us? We, we get into a situation, whether it's a, it, it may be work, and we're working for a company that's, maybe they're not ethical, maybe they're not above board, or maybe it's just a place where you shouldn't be working. You know, it's like a, an alcoholic working in a bar. It's, not the best place to be. And every day you go to work, you're tempted to sin, you're tempted to sin, you're tempted to sin. And 
there have been a, a few times in my life that, that I've had a job like that. And I know others that have had jobs like that. And you, you talk to them and you say, well, why don't you just quit? And it's, I'm going to say 99% of the time, it's the same answer. The money's good. The money's good. But how, what are we trading for our soul? Now, did Joseph suffer because he said no? Potiphar's wife lied. Joseph was thrown into jail, thrown into prison. Did he suffer? For a little while. But he met the baker and, and the, the butcher, and he interpreted their dreams. And when they got out, they told, told Pharaoh about the interpreter, and he was brought to Pharaoh, and... Uh, after a, a time, he was placed over the overseer over Egypt. Then when the famine came, his family reached out to help. They didn't know they were reaching out to Joseph, they re, but they were looking for help. Joseph made contact with his family, convinced them to come to Egypt. Seventy-eight souls walked into Egypt. Four hundred years later, three million souls fo followed Moses out. And that's the lineage of Christ that comes through the Israelites. If Joseph had given in to temptation, he would have stayed in the house as, as the overseer of that, as part of his house. He wouldn't have went to prison. What needed to happen would, would not have happened. And if you look at the overall, the totality of it, if you look at the overall picture, the big picture, he didn't suffer. And that's how we are here on earth. Sometimes it, it seems like if we give up a job or a relationship or some situation and we walk away from it, that we're, that we're going to suffer. And, and we may for a little while. But in the end, that's where our reward is. Sometimes we're rewarded here on earth. But if we stay true to God's word, that reward is in heaven. So in conclusion, y'all know, you know, you, you know what it means when a preacher says, in conclusion, that he has 30 more minutes. So <laughs> not, not tonight. Calm down, Jacob. We've seen that everyone is tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. We study the Bible so we do not sin against God. You know that, fir that very first memory verse at Memphis School of Preaching. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. That's not an accident. I'm, they do that every year. That's, that's why we study the Bible, so, <clears throat> so we don't sin against God. Every time we sin... It's a sin against God every, every single time. Saying no is not always easy. It's not always an easy thing to do. It's very simple. But it's very simple. We get strength from reading God's word to continue to say no. Saying no, uh, when we resist temptations, we will be rewarded in the end. Maybe, there may be some of you here tonight that have not obeyed the gospel. To obey the gospel, you must he hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And what the gospel is, is that Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth, died on the cross, was buried, and resurrected, resurrected the third day. That's the gospel. You must believe it, Hebrews eleven six. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. And what that means is you have a change of mind. A change of mind so strong that it causes you to change your actions. Now, can you change your actions without changing your mind? For a time you can. It's that change of mind that, that's the true repentance. You must confess that Jesus is the Son of God, Matthew 16.32-33. 
must be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. You know, today when someone talks about baptism, we always put it in a religious context. In the first century, people were being baptized for various reasons. That's why, that's why there's that stipulation, baptized for the remission of your sins. Not baptized to join a, a certain church or congregation, not baptized as an outward action to show your... In the first century, they had something in a lot of houses called a mikvah. It looked a lot like a baptistry. It was a, most of them were square and had some steps that went down into them. And before they could go into worship, they had to clean themselves physically. They had to take a bath. Also, this, that, that started with the Holy of Holies. You had the tabernacle set up and you had that lap, labor where the priest had to go in and wash. So in the first century, when Peter is telling them to be baptized for the remission of their sins, they knew that it was a specific kind of baptism, not one to, to clean the, the dirt off the... So there, they knew it was a specific kind of baptism for the remission of their sins. Maybe someone is here tonight that has said that sinner's prayer, has prayed to have Jesus enter your heart, maybe it was 10 or 15 years ago, and you were told that, he, that you were saved, and since then you thought you were safe. You weren't saved. You're not saved. Maybe you responded to the invitation as when you were young, and there's some things you may be confused about. We can help you with those things. Maybe you have some doubts. We can help you with those. Whatever you need, won't you come as we stand and sing?